Okay, welcome to the Chapter 7, Control of Microbial Growth Lecture, or as I like to call it, How to Kill Microbes. So here are the objectives. First, there's a lot of definitions to understand from this chapter. What are the differences between the words sterilization, disinfection, sanitization, and bacteriostasis? Then some of the main methods that are used to achieve those, things like autoclaving, pasteurization, filtration, desiccation, temperature, and radiation. We'll also talk about some chemical disinfection, how they work, and how we achieve chemical sterility. So let's look at some terminology. First, sterilization. This is removing or destroying all microbial life. This even includes the endospores, um, and most toxins would be eliminated through sterilization. Second is disinfection. This is not sterilizing something. This does not kill everything. Disinfection is something that is targeted towards getting rid of the more harmful pathogenic or food spoilage types of microorganisms, but it doesn't kill everything. Sanitization is different than disinfection. Disinfection, as I mentioned, is targeted or focused, so it's looking at ways to kill off the more harmful types. Sanitization is not targeted. It lowers the overall microbial counts of anything there down to safe levels for things like food cons consumption or contacting or using different tools or surfaces. So in something like a food kitchen or research and development facility, you'd probably have um, washing with dish soap, rinsing, and then you'd have a tub with a sanitizer that would get rid of most of the microbes overall that are there. And finally, bacteriostasis. This is not actively killing anything, but it is um, stopping or inhibiting the growth of whatever happens to be there and preventing it from growing any further. So let's look at some ways to achieve these. First, there are physical methods. These would be things like the temperature, filtration, desiccation, and radiation. That's what I'll talk about in this video. The other methods are chemical methods. I'll have a second video that talks about the chemical methods and how those work. So let's look at the physical methods of controlling microbial growth. First is heat. This is probably the most common. There's dry heat, something like a flame or a Bunsen burner. And you could have that on, on the table or out on the lab bench and you could pass whatever piece of equipment you're using, things like sterilizing your tweezers or your inoculating loop by just passing it through the flame a little bit and that would kill off anything that's there so that can achieve complete sterility. There are also the plug-in electronic incinerators that don't have an open flame but they heat up hot enough um, to do the same thing. There's also moist heat so this incorporates the use of water. These would be things like boiling. Boiling would be something that sanitizes or disinfects. It doesn't kill absolutely everything but it kills most things. There is also equipment um, for pasteurizing. That's uh, killing off most things with heat and liquids. And then autoclaving is the most common and most important for a microbiology setting. So let's look at what those do. So here's an autoclave. There is a sealed chamber at the front. There's a thick metal door. This is kind of like the door of a submarine on a movie. There's a big wheel you turn to open and close it. There are big metal spikes that um, stick into the surrounding wall to lock it into place. And uh, high pressure steam is pumped through here. It gets very hot. Uh, there's air that's also circulated around through here with, uh, with filters and screens so particles don't, don't block it. And you can use this to sterilize solid equipment, things like glassware, but also liquids. This is what is used to prepare the nutrient auger for petri plates. You mix it up in here and you can sterilize it. And the steam um, is under enough pressure that it can actually get through the cork down inside um, and get hot enough to sterilize liquids that are inside there as well. And how do you know that autoclave has worked? You put stuff in, you seal a door, you turn it on, you come back an hour or so later. Every time you run one, you have to include a sterilization indicator. Um, one example is a roll of tape. It has pale blue or pale yellow stripes when it starts. If the autoclave has gotten to a high enough temperature and pressure, they turn black. If it hasn't, if you come back and your tape is still yellow or pale blue, you know that something is wrong with the autoclave. You need to adjust the settings or check it or clean it or use a different autoclave because whatever you put in was not sterilized. There's also little paper strips that change color. There's many different variations on this 
type of thing, but the important thing is you have to have something in there that tells you whether it got to the high enough temperature and pressure that actually sterilized your equipment. There's also pasteurization. Now pasteurization does not sterilize things. This is considered a method of disinfection because it's targeted at food spoilage organisms, things that would cause your milk or other products to spoil, and pathogens that might be present in the milk or other products. This is used for some juices, um, and it's similar to an autoclave. There's heating for a short amount of time, but it's less time and it's less intense heat and it doesn't have the intense pressure either. So here's an example. This is what a pasteurization machine looks like. It has all kinds of tubes and pipes and tanks going all over the place. But the basic layout is this. So here in the gray, this is the thing that you want to disinfect. So in this case, it's milk. It could be juice or some other liquid. It runs through pipes that go next to hot water pipes. So that heats it up. For a certain amount of time and then it is run next to cold water pipes to cool it down and it just runs in a cycle of heating and cooling to target those spoilage or pathogen organisms. You can also use cold temperatures. Now cold temperatures don't usually kill off things. They have a bacteriostatic effect so they're stopping whatever is there from growing anymore. This could be refrigeration. This stops most things for a little while, but isn't, uh, isn't permanent. Things can usually be refrigerated for a few days or a week. Um, deep freezing will stop things from growing indefinitely, but some organisms can survive this. So if they're warmed up, then they start multiplying and reproducing. Lyophilization is a term for freeze drying. So you're drying something out in a deep freeze stage. And this, again, kills most things, but not everything. You can also use desiccation, that's drying or dehydrating something without the freezing. So I put it on the same slide because it's kind of related even though it's not, not cold. The absence of water prevents uh, metabolic reaction, reactions. This doesn't kill everything. It, drying out will kill some things, but a lot of bacteria can survive this. And then once they're in the presence of water later, then they will start, um, start growing again. Let's look at filtration next. Filtration just means passing some kind of substance through a screen. In our homes uh, and a lot of other types of normal consumer equipment like vacuum cleaners, you might have a HEPA filter. That stands for high efficiency particulate air. These usually filter out larger particles like dust or pollen, different types of allergens, maybe mold spores, but they're not usually small enough for most microbes. Another type of filter is a membrane filter, and that means it's, it's small enough, very tiny pores. You can filter out all types of microbes. You can even get ones that are small enough to filter out viruses and large proteins. So this can theoretically achieve sterility, but it's not usually used that way because it's kind of a slow... Uh, labor-intensive process. This is a little filter. This is the membrane filter here and you'll notice this hose. It's a vacuum hose. This is actually a vacuum chamber. It has to be a vacuum chamber to pull the liquid down through the filter. These filters are so so fine and tiny that without this vacuum hose most liquids um, have enough surface tension that they just pool and stay on top. It doesn't, it doesn't flow down through a filter on its own. So a filter is good for very small amounts at a time. Um, maybe for something that's heat sensitive and can't go through an autoclave, you could use a filter, but they're really not very doable for large scale liquids. Radiation is another thing that can be used to control microbial growth. There are two major kinds. The way they work, ionizing radiation, um, it ionizes or takes apart water molecules to create very reactive forms that interfere with a bunch of chemical reactions in the cell. There's also non-ionizing radiation that damages DNA by creating a bunch of extra chemical bonds in the, right, in, in the wrong places. So that definitely messes up the DNA. If you're looking at the energy spectrum, this little strip right here, this is the visible light. So these are wavelengths of energy that our eyes can detect and we see as colors. Um, down here below it, this is the type of radiation that damages microbes. So ultraviolet, that's your non-ionizing. That's the one that's messing with the DNA bonds. And then lower than that, um, you've got your gamma rays and x-rays. Those are the ionizing ones that would be um, making the reactive forms of water that interfere with chemical reactions. So that's, that's where 
this radiant energy. It's just other wavelengths along the electromagnetic spectrum.